don't get me wrong, the first year of pandemic was a blast. But I'm kind of kind of done with it now. I'd uh, I'd like it to stop now. You know, most of the people that I talk to will tell me, and understandably so, that it was a miserable time for them for a variety of reasons. And then every once in a while, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to somebody and they'll answer me in hushed tones and say, it was great. I really enjoyed myself and I don't feel like I should... I should admit this to anybody. Like I was super productive and, and all of these things that, that I hadn't been able to do. I was, I was able to do. I get that part of it because I'm, I'm one of the people in some ways it's been easier for, because, you know, being in lockdown wasn't that different than my usual lifestyle. So, you know, that part wasn't, wasn't hard, but it has been an enormous pain in the ass, obviously for, for my work, you know, we haven't been able to, tour we couldn't tour the last album we're hoping to tour this album you know but right now it's like kind of iffy who knows and it's also particularly hard as a father of a four-year-old who isn't old enough to be vaccinated yet that makes every day complicated and stressful and scary i guess there's there, there's some positive there from the standpoint of you won't look back on this period and feel like you missed any major milestones because the two of you are are kind of stuck together yeah, I mean, there's that part of it, you know, but it's, you know, it's, it's sad to, you know, the, the other day he said to me, uh, remember when we didn't have to wear masks? And I said, I said, can you remember that? Because, you know, two years, two years is a long time for a four year old, you know, and uh, he said, when are the scientists going to figure out how to stop the germ? I was like, good question. I feel like they did to some degree, but we just uh, yeah. no, haven't well, been doing yeah. a very good job heeding those, those yeah. warnings. Then I, then I turned on Fox News and made him watch that for a while and said, here's the real problem. I don't have any children myself. What, what's your sense of how he's processing the whole thing? Well, you know, he, I, I think really well, as far as I can tell. And, and I mean, the great thing about little kids is their, their reality is their reality. You know, it's like, this is just how it is. And it's, I think, someone who's four it's probably easier to digest than i would imagine it's really hard for like young teenage kids you know to just be like blossoming and their hormones are going crazy and suddenly it's like you got to stay in this little apartment all the time and you can't do all the normal teenage stuff that that sounds really dire to me are are you uh are you in an apartment no i'm in a house my studio It's not the end of the world from that standpoint. He's got he's got a little bit of room to move around in. You're you're not on top of each other all the time, right? Yeah, almost. <laughs> it's not a ton of room, but it's you know it's not too bad. A lot of parents that I talk to who have been making like a concerted effort in their children's life to get them off of screens have kind of been forced to to give in on that. And oh that yeah, there's just like you can't go outside. So here, just take this iPad. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the more comforting aspects about the whole pandemic is it's like whatever works, whatever gets, whatever gets you through the night. What role has music played in your life over the past uh, was it uh, 20, 22 months? I wasn't looking to make an album this soon after the last one, which only came out you know a little over a year ago. But since we couldn't tour, what else are you going to do? You know, <laughs> but, but I also you know it really just kind of accidentally happened very very organically just sort of cropped up that oh we're making an album all of a sudden but i wasn't it wasn't on the plan the album that came out in 2020 had you considered holding on to it putting on a shelf until you could actually get out and tour on it yeah there was discussions about that and ultimately i decided you know we can't go out on tour but people still need music maybe now more than ever so Let's put it out now. And it actually felt like a good time to put it out when it came out in like October of 2020. And it was definitely an experiment to, you know, put out an album in the thick of a pandemic in its first year. But when it came out, it actually felt like the right time to me. It felt good. So somebody online referred to it as the Eels' sweetest natured album was, was how they put it. And, you know, obviously taken as a whole, certainly more positive than than kind of other entries in, in the back catalog. Is that is that a coincidence that um, you had such a kind of relative ray of sunshine come out during such a dark time? I mean, 
consciously it was probably a coincidence, but unconsciously it makes sense that I was probably making something full of compassion and warmth at, during that time. Something that kind of fascinates me is what people tend to gravitate toward when they're dealing with something difficult. And, and obviously, it varies from person to person. You know, in, in my own life, I know a lot of people who like to really kind of lean into it and listen to the, the most depressing thing possible. Where do you where do you sort of fall on that? You know, where do you, where do you fall on that when you're dealing with something on a personal level? What do you put on the stereo? I mean, I definitely understand the misery love company theory. It can be a really comforting thing when you're down and you listen to something that makes you feel like you're not the only one. That's that's a great thing. But I tend to go the other way probably more often than just I really like to listen to something overtly uplifting whenever possible. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking about that album specifically through the context of Earth to Dora. And I know that the the genesis of that song was, I mean, it's, it's literally you trying to cheer up somebody in your life through a series of text messages. And I wonder, is that a pretty fair analogy for the function of a song in that context of, of really just, you know, trying to trying to get somebody through a dark time? Yeah, but usually the somebody is myself, I think. I, I, think, I think probably most of my songs that sound like they're me talking to somebody, I, I maybe I am talking to somebody specific, but I'm probably also simultaneously talking to myself. I think a lot of the times it's it's about me trying to convince myself of something. I was listening to to an interview that you did, I think with maybe a German guy, and he was um, surprised that you seemed like a happy person. <laughs> Is that something that you get a lot in your life? <laughs> well, sometimes, I guess. I mean, I don't think it should be a surprise, really, because I think for a listener who's paying attention to what I do, it's almost always in the name of getting to a positive place, you know, but you have, you have to get through the muck to get there. And and maybe it's that I do go through the muck that makes me happier in the end. You're processing it in a very public way. Yeah. Well, well, you know, that's, that's the performer. Is it that simple? I mean, is it as far as, um, using music as a method of catharsis as a method of processing i mean none of it's simple it's it's amazing to me all the different layers and ways that music works for me that's one part of it in terms of actually songwriting through all of this uh, specifically what role is it playing. It sounds like structure was a really big part of it. I mean, I think that that was something that a lot of us have been lacking over the last two years. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I was basically kind of raised by wolves. And so I, I, uh, at some point, uh, early on in my probably early twenties, I figured out that like the way for me to stay sane was to provide structure for myself. And so I've always been really structured. My days are, you know, pretty structured and that that's a way for me to feel safe in the world. It must be helpful to have that throughout all this, you know, when, when things are kind of falling apart around you, knowing that you're waking up the next day and have a certain series of things that you need to do can, right. can be helpful. Yeah. I'm very rarely bored. I've always got something you know, on my schedule that I'm supposed to be doing. Are you keeping office hours? I mean, are you, are you really sitting down? Are you, are you no, I don't. carving out a certain number of hours a day? I have done it that way in the past, but more often than not, the way it is these days is like with the making of this album specifically, you know, it was an unusual way. It's the first time I've made a album in, in the thick of the pandemic. The other one... The one before uh, Earth to Dora, only one song was done at the beginning of the pandemic. And the rest of it had been done bef before the pandemic started. But this one was all done during the pandemic, and it meant that it was all done, you know, via email and that kind of thing. And so, and and it becomes this like 
train that once I get on, I can't get off it. And, uh, you know, it can be stressful at times because it's like, I got so much other stuff going on with, you know, parenting and all the other things in my life that, and it, it, it's so different than like when we could just say, okay, for the month of June, we're going to go in the studio every day and make an album. Now it's just like squeeze it in, you know, before, before the kid wakes up, you know, get, get John Parrish, your vocal back before it's his days over in England, you know, stuff like that. You know, it's, it's a, it's a very different way to make a record. There's a certain irony to it because from a certain standpoint, I guess, theoretically, you've got more hours during the day because you're not, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Some of the obligations that you might have had otherwise, you're unable to do. So at least like theoretically, you should have nothing but time, but it is that. I mean, to me, it's actually kind of the opposite. When you, when, you know, when you say we're going in for a month to a studio to make an album, everyone respects that and leaves you alone. But when you're, when you're at home, just living your life and trying to squeeze out recording sessions here and there, everything like n nobody uh, takes it as seriously that, you know, that you're working. And so it's like, Hey, can't you do this or that now? You know, come on, you're home. You know, Once you've got in your head that there's an album coming out at a certain point, you can't really, you can't treat it casually. Is part of it sort of setting deadlines? I, I'm not good with deadlines. I'm not, I'm not good under pressure in general in any situations in life. So I always try to go out of my way to just make something, make an album without knowing when it's going to come out. Like this one was another example of it. Like I made this one. I don't think I even told anyone in, in you know the label or the management that I was working on it for a while. And then at some point they said, oh, by the way, you know, uh, I got a finished album when we need one. We need one, but I was like, you know, the other one just came out a year ago. So, you know, there's obviously no hurry. And then, you know, that they just took that and ran with it and said, like, let's put it out now. And I was like, well, okay. <laughs> there is a structure, though, in knowing that it's going to specifically be an album versus obviously there are methods now by which people just kind of release songs, do bedroom recordings, put stuff out into the world. But it's still, for you, it's still really built around the structure of of an album. Yeah. Uh, you know, pretty early on, once there's two or three song, new songs, I, I start to, you know, I'm, I'm actually sitting here where I did a lot of the work on this album and there's a little note I have taped on the wall right in front of my face it says put it in the lp which is my reminder to start sequencing right away and every time there's a the latest version of whatever song we're working on i listen to it in context with the other songs and then it starts to like formulate the idea of an album and i start to get an idea of like okay what other kinds of songs would be nice to fill this out and make it really good. It's a rock record. That to me is is the through line. Oh well, yeah. I thank you. Uh, I, I like I like to rock now and then. You know, every twenty years. How much of that is a result of that of that sticky note of just realizing that this is the specific aesthetic that I'm I'm building the record around? Yeah, um, I, that's the kind of stuff that like I, I'm just not conscious of. You know, you just, you just do it. You just make it, and then. You know, I can look back on stuff years later and go, oh, that's what I was thinking. That's what this might have been about. Or, you know, you know, I've noticed like there's a lot of songs that I've written in the past that I didn't think I was writing about myself. And then, you know, I listened to them like five or 10 years later and I go, oh, man, that was totally what I was going through at the time. But I, you know, just yeah. for some reason wouldn't let myself know that. Yeah. I, I just meant um, from a, a sound perspective, but that that's a much more interesting answer. I, you know, I, I just meant from um, sort of, you know, again, keeping in a line of uh, the through line of this being a rocker. That's what I try to do here. Give interesting answers to less interesting. Questions. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate you're elevating my art. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Otherwise, it's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's John Parrish is, is what, who's bringing the rock and cool. Drew murder. Uh, bringing a lot of the rock too. And, and, um, 
It's there's nothing like rocking. I mean, let's face it. There's a reason why there's a reason why everybody wants to go to the ACDC concert, you know. <laughs> it's kind of surprising though cuz given how the how the album developed, I would assume that would kind of be a product of everybody being in the room playing together, but this was very much the opposite of that. I know, and like, you know, I'm hesitant to talk about the process of how this album was made because it really to me sounds like a room record. It sounds like everyone's in the room together and I I don't want to that that's the the thing that is a shame about talking about how you make the sausage sometimes, you know. <laughs> it's like like once you see it, you know, it's never going to taste the same. I don't I don't want to like wreck it for a a listener to I, I you know, I would rather not a listener have to think about like how it was made. I'd rather them picture it how they picture it in their mind when they're listening. I don't always find it to be a super interesting conversation, but it it's interesting from the standpoint of we're of just living an interesting time. Yeah, I mean I can talk all day. I mean I can listen to people talk about it all day. I'm you know, this is what I do and I'm interested in like, you know, like like I, I can devour eight hours of the Beatles making I was going to ask about that. Yeah, have you been yeah. Have you been watching that? Oh yeah, I watched it all immediately. You know, and, and you know, I can't get enough of that kind of thing. But you know, I think for the casual uh, listener, you know, that kind of thing might be a little much. In this specific instance, part of what's interesting about it to me is I have heard you in the past describe the for you what has been the most difficult part of maybe not being a musician but but specifically of putting out a record is that first moment of basically bearing your soul and, and playing a probably on an acoustic guitar yeah. this really sort of raw version of a song and and your your band hearing the lyrics for the first time yeah that's you know that's always hard that's that's never easy you know even the same with this album it's like the first time i you know i i send my lyrics and vocal to john Parrish. you know it's just like oh you know it's always it's this awful vulnerable feeling you know and yeah it's 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 even harder though when you're all in the same room uh, particularly with some of the guys that I work with who are just like, you know, ready to just completely humiliate me at any moment. So, Have you ever played a song in front of them and have they ever just kind of <laughs> not laughed at it, but screwed with you a bit? It's like, then, then my mother hit me. <laughs> no, it's never, Does that happen? No, no not quite like that. Nothing that uh, no, nothing that extreme uh, that I recall, but um yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes there's just like little jokes or comments where you're just like, oh, come on, man. I'm really trying to emote here. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's probably the hardest part of the job, really. It's still, di- I mean, obviously it's still difficult. And, and, and we, we're, we're, we all have been in a place where we've sent an email to somebody or, or, or left a, a message on an answering machine where we were burying ourselves and, quote Tom Petty, the, the waiting is the hardest part of, you know, just sitting and um, not, not getting that feedback in real time. But, but uh, the flip side of it is you, I mean, have, haven't you kind of removed some of that vulnerability through this process? I mean, you would think after doing it for this long, it would get easier, but it, it doesn't really, it's always like a, just awkward. Yeah, yeah I, I sort of just mean from the standpoint of sending an email to somebody versus playing a, a song in front of someone, you know, do you feel like you can be vulnerable in a way that maybe you wouldn't be able to, to be face to face? Yeah, at least when I send the email, I can just I don't have to be there to hear them laugh at, you know, whatever. I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Don't, you know, I, don't, I don't have to see them wince. <laughs> Do you feel like that sort of like afforded you an opportunity to be more vulnerable? Or I mean, I, I don't not it's I'm not like implying that I ever got the sense that you you were ever holding anything back. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't. That's why it, it's so uncomfortable and so awkward is because I don't hold anything back. I don't I don't put any filter on that. It's, you know, it's ultimately it's a good thing. I think, you know, that it is uncomfortable. It's like, OK, get ready for this. <laughs> yeah, it's good that it's uncomfortable and it's good that you know that you're surrounding yourself with people who if push comes to shove will be critical, you know. I mean, I, I'm sure that there are 
a lot of bands out there, particularly at a certain level, who surround themselves with people who don't put checks on them. And because of that, they just put terrible stuff out into the world. Uh, you know, who knows? Um, I mean, all you can do is try to do your best. And that, that can be a lot of pressure and it can be hard sometimes, you know. It's good to have people in your life who whose opinion you value and who will like push back on you if something isn't quite right. Yeah. That that can be a good thing, but it's that's a tricky thing to do with someone, you know, as I'm sure you know. You know, the past several years, how consistent has the the lineup of the band been? Well, it's sort of two different things. There's the recording band is anything goes. You know, whoever whoever I'm working with any given year is is who they are. And then touring, it's been pretty consistent for the last several tours um and uh, you know i'd be happy if it was always consistent but it's also you know it's fun to be able to switch things up and keep things interesting and uh, get different things from different collaborators so it's generally that first time you're playing the songs in front of people it's it's not always the same group of people right there's a lot there's a lot of the characters are pretty constant uh, but then there's always some uh, changing part part of the upside too is if in the very off chance somebody is going to laugh at you better to be in that room than when you're your albums out in the world or you're on stage in front of people oh good point that's a good point you know they they could be doing me a favor <laughs> do you feel like having a kid has made you has it made you softer has parenthood made you soft Definitely in as a person, but I don't, I mean, I would say judging from this album, not artistically. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's certainly not a, uh, it's not 10 cats in the cradles. It's, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not the, uh, I've, you know, I've avoided, you know, doing the probably expected, you know, fatherhood, Album. Not to say that I might not do do some version of that at some point, but you know, I just have, I've had my hands full with actual fatherhood, and I felt like I wanted to write about different things. I mean, also like the Castle's Cradle is a kind of a dark song at the end of the day. Oh, it's a tearjerker. It's not that whole thing of. Uh... That people talk about when somebody has kids and suddenly everything is like the world is beautiful. It's like kind of kind of a messed up song at the well, end. Yeah, I mean, yeah, most of it is. It's so beautiful and great having a kid, but then it's terrible at the end because he he becomes a teenager and he doesn't give a shit about you anymore. <laughs> at the end, it's a, it's kind of a song about the harshness of the world. Well, the harshness of teenagers. <laughs> Sure, and and just sort of the cy- the cycle of uh, a fatherhood, and maybe maybe losing touch with family members. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, I'm not looking forward to the teen years, but I'm enjoying the the younger years. <laughs> How far out is touring at this point? Uh, it's coming up soon. It's um, March, which is a few months away. Have you been missing it? Oh, yeah, completely. Like, we're all chomping at the bit. If playing a song in front of people for the first time is the most difficult part of the process, is the is touring the most fulfilling thing for you? I mean, it's all ultimately fulfilling. Like, I, I love making a new song in the studio because at the end of the day, there's something that exists in the world that didn't exist the day before, and that's really exciting. And, um, yeah, but then playing live is extremely exciting too. It's, it's all great. I recommend, I recommend getting into this business. Yeah. Yeah. Except for except everything for, around except it. For the it sounds like, part. I mean, it, it, I mean, it sounds like you, 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 yeah. you never expected to be doing it for as long as you have. Oh yeah. I mean, I didn't expect to do it once. I, I had no expectations. I had no hopes or dreams when I was a kid. And I, I'm still constantly amazed that I got to do it once, let alone so many times now. And How does one accidentally like definitely one enter the into the business? In the world. 
Well, I didn't accidentally enter into the business. Like I, I, I was in, you know, probably like 20, 21. And I had never considered, you know, getting into the quote unquote music business. Um, and it was my girlfriend at the time who said, you know, I was just kind of lost and I was just trying to figure out what am I going to do with myself? You know, all my friends were going to college and I didn't care about college. And my girlfriend said, like, why don't you try to do something with your music? You're really good at it. And I just thought, well, I don't have any other plans, so I might as well. And so I just decided that was my mission and I worked really hard on it, but I never had any realistic dream or fantasy that, it was actually going to turn into something. And it's just un- unbelievable that it did. In, in hindsight, do you think that was ultimately helpful was not having at least unrealistic expectations? Yeah. Yeah. I think like being hopeless was, was an asset because, you know, really because I, I had nothing to lose. So I just went full bore, you know, it was like the only, it became the only thing that mattered. Yeah. And, and I mean, at a certain point you build up, you build up momentum. And I assume that like that part of, you can can correct me if I'm wrong, but part of why you've put out, you know, essentially two records during the the pandemic when a lot of people have just been holding onto them is you need to keep that momentum going. Well, uh, yeah, that's not why I'm doing it. It's just, it, just, it happens organically, you know, it's just, you know, the, like this album, like I said, like it, I wasn't looking to make an album at the time and it just happened. And it's, it's like, well, I'm starting to kind of wish we had sat on it for a while now. Th- this has been more difficult than the one we put out in 2020 in terms of, you know, I'm sure you've heard about the vinyl shortage, for example, you know, and it's like there's not enough vinyl in the world for people that are putting vinyl on it right now and stuff like that is like, there's a lot of headaches. And then, you know, we might have to cancel our tour. We don't know yet. Like it's just, it's, it's pretty stressful. Uh, there is a part of me that kind of would like to just sit out the next year, but it's too late now. So there's a difference between having put out the last record in October of 2020 versus March of 2020 in that, when you put the last one out, you didn't have any expectations that you were going to tour on it. Right. And there was still vinyl in the world. <laughs> and run out of vinyl yet. You know. Obviously there's a lot of different ways to listen to an album at this point. Can you put out a record and not put it on vinyl and maybe have it come out on vinyl at some later date? Well, I mean, I'm sure, you, you know, I'm sure a lot of people just put it on Spotify and that's all. Uh, and, but, um, as far as physical copies go, vinyl is, is the thing that people care about now the most, and which I'm delighted about because I love vinyl and it's fun to have vinyl, you know. But you know, we we were told, you know, we do a a, a standard version and a, and then a deluxe version of the album, and we we were confirmed, you know, that we could do the the deluxe one on pink vinyl and the standard one on yellow vinyl. And then just recently we're told, oh, there's no more pink vinyl left in the world right now. So now all we can do, they said, you, you know, we got enough yellow for you to do the deluxe one in yellow. And so the standard one has to be black now. So then you have to go tell all your fans that, oh, you know, I know you're expecting pink, but now you're going to get yellow and stuff like that. It's just, you know, it's a pain. At least, in, at least there's enough vinyl in the world to specifically to put out the record, even if it's not exactly the color. Well, I hope let's see, let's see what happens. You know, I mean, yeah. At this point, I, I I will feel lucky if everybody gets some kind of vinyl, whatever color it is. You know, they but they might even run out of it. You know, black soon too. You know, so who knows? What was the process like of putting out an album and just not touring on it at all? I mean, when when was the last time you did that? Oh, we've done that. Like you know, oddly enough, like um, the Ombre Lobo album, which is. I think one of our more live rock sounding albums, we didn't tour for that. Um, but then, you know, maybe the next year we did. Was that, that was just a matter of timing or? Um, I just wasn't feeling it at the time. I didn't, it didn't feel right. Uh, Chet, who uh, has been a guitarist for many years now, uh, 
became unavailable. Uh, and I just thought, eh, I, don't, I don't feel like doing this right now. But then we did it. And then, then we went out the next year with whatever album came out after that. And this, a lot of the songs from that Ombre Lobo album became and, and still are like staples of our live shows. At this point, it's been so long since you've been on the road, whether you, whether or not you feel like it, as long as the venues are open, I assume that you're going to tour on the thing. Well, the weird thing is it's only been a little over two years, which it seems like 20 years, you know, but it was like, Two years ago, we were on tour. It's like still, yeah, it's still amazing to me that it was only two years ago. It's still a, a long time to not do something that you've been doing for so long. Well, I mean, two years is kind of the norm for most bands and artists. You know, that sometimes we do it every year, but two years is usually as often as, as most acts do it. 